Uh, like many Australians, I experienced this incredible bushfire season firsthand. It was unprecedented. It was fueled by the climate crisis that we're in the middle of. Hotter weather in our country exposes us to major risks, and we saw this very clearly over the past summer. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here at the National Climate Emergency Summit, uh, along with other eminent Australians and the community, uh, people who are interested and concerned about this issue, to hear from experts and others about a transition to a zero carbon economy. There's no question at all that the science is clear that Australia is in for a world of hell unless we start to take climate change seriously. And taking climate change seriously means having a strategy that crosses the political divide, declares an emergency, and uses the full resources of the national government to start to reduce our emissions and to prepare Australia for a climate crisis. So uh, it's a good thing that this summit's taking place today. It's the start of an important movement to push our politics in the right direction. Uh, it's incredible that we've had so many people who wanted to be a part of this summit and so many turned away. And I'm pleased to be here as a part of this group to lend my voice to a call for a climate emergency and a transition to a zero carbon economy. Having said that, I'd like to hand over to Ian Dunlop and I think after that, Professor Michael Mann will speak to you. Sure, I'll oh, Michael. No worries, no worries mate. Um, so, uh, I'm honored to be here at this uh, Climate Emergency Summit. Um, I'm actually a climate scientist. I came here to do a sabbatical. I planned that out two years ago. I was going to come to Australia and work with scientists here to understand the linkages between climate change and extreme weather events. And as it happens, I arrived for what is arguably the most profound bout of extreme weather that Australia has seen. Uh, I've seen the unprecedented heat and drought the bushfires and now more recently the floods. Um, so we've seen extremes at both ends and make no mistake, this is climate change. The impacts of climate change are no longer subtle. We are seeing them play out in a profound way here in Australia. Uh, Australia really has to make a, a, a choice here. Um, are they going to, are we going to recognize that we do have a crisis on our hands and demand that our government, that the politicians actually do something about the problem, or are we going to allow uh, our politicians to continue to deny, to delay, to deflect? Uh, people ask me, is this a new normal that we're in now? The extreme weather that we've seen, the devastating bushfires and floods and dust storms and hail storms, is this a new normal? No, a new normal is the best case scenario. If we act now, if we bring our carbon emissions down by a factor of two within the next 10 years, we can prevent the worsening of the problem. But we are still going to have to adapt to and, and be resilient in the face of the changes that have already happened. It's a question of how bad are we willing to let it get. If we act now, we can prevent it from getting worse. Just to answer what Mike and Peter have said, the, the big problem Australia has got is we are not really seriously looking at the risks of climate change. We've seen some of the impact occurring obviously in the last few months, a lot worse than people expected. But the implication of what Michael is saying is that because there's inertia in the climate system, what we're seeing happen today is the result of emissions that were made 10, 20, 30 years ago. We already have locked in a much further degree of impact, which will get worse than the climate. So we have to be able to become more resilient, we have to adapt, which is what our politicians are now starting to talk about. But what they're not talking about is to stop it becoming even worse. And that means you have to cut emissions very quickly. It's the absolute priority now. We have to do all the other good things that uh, Minister Taylor is talking about, like technological innovation and so on. But the fact is, unless you cut emissions, we will not get on top of this problem. And that's why we have the emergency, because it's a very short space of time to do it. And uh, whilst it's, we're beginning to see a change, we've seen the community now 
uh, expressing increasing concern and the need for real action. Business is starting to move. The regulators in Australia are screening and saying, look, unless you start to address this, we will end up in major problems with the stability of the financial system. But we're still seeing a weak response and the people are not, they're not really talking about the real problem. And the objective of this summit is to start to get us to the point where they are. Because without a push from the community, we will still have this soft response that says, yes, we can adapt. Yes, we've got to 2050 for zero. And the fact is, we hit zero by 2050, which is the catch cry across the camera above the top, is nowhere near fast enough. It's going to have to be very far faster. So that's what we're going to talk about. Hopefully, we'll build the momentum uh, from this conference to really carry that message through to the official, the official in this country and to the business community. So, uh, throw questions at us and uh, let us know who you want to answer the question. Um, so perhaps yourself, if you have set up. Um, we're talking about reasons and ways that we can actually unpack the crisis at the moment. What are you hoping that you actually do to come to the solution at the end of this conference? What are we looking at? How do we go about it? We're hearing really great things, but how do we get there? Okay. Well, the first thing you've got to do if you want a solution is to be honest about what the problem is. We haven't done that in this country. We've, uh, we've fiddled around the edge. We've pretended we can do it with minor changes. You can't. What we've got to do is to stop all fossil fuel expansion straight away. No present. We've got to start to wind back the existing fossil fuels to reduce our emissions. But it's not obviously a just an Australian problem. We can't just do it in Australia. We have to be active in the global sphere to convince the rest of the world to move in that direction too. And they've all got to do the same thing because they're not doing it. Um, so we've got to become fully committed as a country to seeing that happen. And behind that, all the technological innovations that uh, Ross Garner's been in his recent book, for example, and so on, they all make absolute good sense. But they're not going to deliver the sort of change we need at the speed we now need it because we've left it too long. So the solutions are all there. But what we need is a policy framework that encourages them rather than stops them happening. I mean, we get a lot of noise about the fact that you know, we're now one of the major solar users in, in the world, uh, which is great, but it's happened in spite of the government, not because of it. And if we really had a government working behind all those things, then we would be a hell of a lot further forward than we currently are. And that's what we've got to get to. And it's no longer acceptable to keep playing games and pretending we're moving whilst we're doing basically nothing. And that applies to the corporate world as well as it does to political why is it that you made that jump, obviously, from your previous role with coal uh, to heal? What is it about that you, you decided to even need to come across? Well, it's not a jump. I've been in this for 50 years, and as time's gone by, the science has got clearer, the evidence has got clearer. There comes a point where it's clear you've got to do something, and that happened to me in the 1980s. So it's been a gradual evolution, and uh, I've been involved in the efforts to get the solutions in place for 30 years. I could add to what uh, sorry, if you don't mind, look down the barrel. Yeah, if I could add to what uh, Ian. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> if I can add to what Ian has just said, um, look, uh, Australia was actually leading the world. Australia was the first major industrial country to actually put a price on carbon. We put a price on carbon. If we level the playing field, then renewable energy can compete fairly, and we will transition rapidly away from fossil fuels to renewable energy, as we need to do. Uh, when uh, Australia passed emissions trading scheme, we saw carbon emissions go down by a factor of 10% within the first nine months. Uh, and then when the Abbott administration rescinded that policy, we saw them go back up. So we know what the solution is. We've got to price carbon, we've got to provide incentives for renewable energy, we have to transition rapidly away from our burning of fossil fuels, and we need government incentives to help us do that, and we need politicians who are willing to support those policies. Can I ask a question? At the end of the day, the only way that we can get this under control 
and that includes by supporting state and local governments that have got decent emission reduction targets, is to have a national government that takes the climate crisis seriously. You can't leave local and state governments to do the heavy lifting. This is a primary task for the national government, akin to the sort of duties it has when the national interest is at stake and the country is threatened. So the Council of Australian Governments should be formulated to make sure that that takes place, but it requires political will and leadership from the Prime Minister to recognise that this is an issue that transcends party lines and affects Australians now, but even more so in the future. How likely do you think of that realisation that changing looks the world will happen? Uh, I think that what we've experienced over the past couple of months in Australia has been a big wake-up call for many people. But it's only the beginning of what will happen with greater intensity and ferocity if we don't take the climate crisis seriously now. Will Canberra and the leaders listen? Will Mr Morrison recognise that it's his duty as our leader to take this issue seriously? Uh, that's partly up to him and it's partly up to us to make sure he hears clear messages, which is what this summit's all about. Peter, can I ask, what is your view of the Sally um, Steckel Climate Bill? UK-style Well, I haven't had a chance to read the bill. I think it's fine for people to be bringing those sorts of bills into the Parliament for consideration. I don't, with all respect uh, to the member, expect that it's going to have a great deal of success on the floor, but it will be debated, and that's an important first step. What happens if you get to the end of these two days where you've had some great ideas and it's been a collective uh, brainstorm, but there's not very many legal votes in that, in that room over the next two days, it seems. So how do you make sure that the policies that you want to introduce in action is actually flowed through? Well, I think uh, both Ian and Michael have made very important points, but Ian point, Ian's point about the economy is absolutely right. I mean, it's only a couple of days ago that the Governor of the Reserve Bank really said something quite strong about how we need to take up our renewable energy opportunities and that government needs to provide certainty to the market. We want to develop a roadmap uh, with other expert advice and eminent Australians to provide some clarity about how you get to a zero emission state, how you transition to that state, and how you do it effectively. And the energy and the expertise that can come from a summit like this will enhance and build on that. But this is also a challenge for Australians wherever we live. Because if we do love the country as we do, if we do care about it as we do, then we can't allow it to become a hothouse hell. It just can't become the furnace that we've experienced regularly, uh, the thing that we've seen take us apart as a community over the last couple of months. So when someone says these fires are not precedented, the answer is, I'm sorry, the climate crisis tells us that these fires were unprecedented and that requires emergency action to address. What do you say to those people who say, sorry. Do you think the zero net emission targets of Sydney and Melbourne Council by 2040 are achievable? Do you think they're realistic? Yeah, look, I think all of these things are achievable if you have um, the weight of the community and the weight of policy all behind them. And the fact is we haven't had that in this country. What we've had is everything pulling in different directions. So things have happened in spite of governments and so on. What we need now is to get everybody, everybody on the same page, including the coal industry, because that's been one of the biggest issues. And the fact is that coal has been historically very important to this country, has delivered a large part of the wealth that we now enjoy in Melbourne, Sydney, as well as North Queensland. And so on. But the fact is that there comes a point you can have too much of a good thing. And the fact is we can't keep any longer using coal and have a sustainable, livable climate. So we have to change. We need to have transition plans that help the people who are going to be affected. But the point is that the coal industry itself, in places like Queensland, if we keep doing what we're currently doing, is not sustainable because the, the weather conditions, the temperature conditions, we get to where you can't operate in that environment. So it's in the interests of people in the coal industry to make this change. And we have to have that debate. We can't just keep saying, because we've had coal ever since World War II, or longer. But that's the way the world will continue. So, you know, this issue of coal has become the real bugbear in this country. It needs to come out of the table. Um, 
coal industry employees have been very constructive historically, I know from my own experience, when you really have big problems, if they understand the challenges that are there and why there has to be change, we're not doing that. And the worst thing you can do in a, in a high risk situation is not prepare people for the change that's going to be inevitable. Because what will happen is you'll end up in complete chaos. And you can see that in the South Coast in the last few months. Because if you look at the way that people had to respond, all sorts of things happened that we never expected. The internet went down, the car went down, ATMs didn't work, people didn't buy their traffic, you know, all that sort of stuff. You know, when you look at this on a bigger scale, and what happens if we don't start planning for it is we have complete societal breakdown. And that's what we've got to avoid. So it is totally irresponsible for politicians who are trying to hold us into a cold future to ignore the risks that they are now placing these employees in by not being prepared to address the problem. We can plan quickly, we can have more jobs in different industries in those parts of the world. And it's not just here, it's also in China and India, all around the world, this is going to have to happen. But you've got to start being honest about the risk and planning about how you get managed the transition. And that's what we've got to do in Melbourne, in Sydney, North Queensland, you name it. It's all got to start moving. But as a, a, a cohesive plan change that everybody gets behind. Can I ask a question of Michael? Yeah. Um, what do you say to those who say the language of emergency and alarm is actually alienating those people that need to be persuaded? Well, you know, what I say is that you have to, you know, tell the truth. And, and the, the truth might be difficult for some people to hear. Now, if somebody is truly alienated from taking action on climate because we're using words like emergency, I would question whether there's really any possibility of engaging them on this issue. A lot of that is sort of crocodile tears. You hear climate change deniers, for example, who will say, oh, we're offended that you're using terms like emergency. Well, these people were never going to be on the side of action anyways. What we need to do is mobilize people who aren't against the science, who, who recognize the science, who recognize there's a problem, but aren't yet convinced that there's something that we can do about it and that we need to act now. What we're saying is we do have an emergency. We do have a crisis on our hands. And all you have to do is turn on your television set or look out your window to see that here in Australia. Australia is on the front lines of dealing with the impacts of climate change now. Dangerous climate change isn't far off in the future for Australia. It's here now. And Australia can also be on the front lines of doing something about the climate crisis. And, and, and what we need, of course, is for our politicians to stop talking about adaptation and resilience. These are just code words for let's pretend we're doing something when we're not. We need to solve this problem at its source, which is the burning of fossil fuels. We have to get off fossil fuels as quickly as possible. That's what we're trying to say here today. We have a crisis, but we also have a solution. We know what the solution is. We just have to implement it. Get off fossil fuels, embrace renewable energy. There you are. I think we're done. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks for coming. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry.